Hello and welcome to the HDL to VHDL tutorial series. Uh, we're just doing a little addendum video here about how to start a new Cordis project and make some schematic files, which is a visual representation of logic gates. And we're going to run through that and show you how to make uh, one from a pre-made template. And here we go. Let's actually do that. So, first thing we can do here is, in our demo folder, we'll see our template schematic 1. It is incomplete. Um, if you really wanted to, you can double-click this and it will open up in Cordis. And we'll have a look around in the file here. So what we can see here is three blank schematics. Um, one is saying we'd like to make an OR gate from NANDs. The second one is asking us to make an AND gate from NAND gates. And the third one is just a NOT gate from NANDs. We also have four dip switches, numbered 1, 2, 3, and 4. These are our inputs. And three outputs, LED1, LED2, and LED3. So now that we have a look at what we want to be working on, let's go ahead and close this and open up and start a new Cordis project. So we can double-click Cordis here on the desktop. And we'll create a new project. I'm going to put this working directory for the project in our Cordis Projects folder. And I'm going to make a new folder, and we'll call it Breadboard Inputs. Oh, that says Broadboard. We'll select that as our directory folder. And the name of the project can also be Breadboard Inputs. You'll notice that that also overrides the top-level design entity, which we'll discuss shortly. But basically all that means is this is the most advanced chip that we'll be working with. This is the highest level uh, gate that we want. So let's click Next here to proceed through our new project wizard. So here for files, our project files, we can look up that uh, schematic design that we just looked at a moment ago, which was saved in our demo folder schematic one incomplete dot bdf so let's open that up and click add to add it to our project we'll click next <coughs> to continue god bless you <laughs> and in our device family we're using the cyclone 2 processor and there is a list of available devices which we could scroll through or we do have a name filter here to look up the device by its serial number, which is EP2C5T144C8, assuming you're using the same hardware that I am. If you're not, good luck in the list. Have fun traversing that. Let's click Next here. We have extra tools, third-party plugins that we could be using, but we won't be using in this tutorial, so let's skip on past this. And lastly, we do have a brief summary of what we've done. So we have our project breadboard inputs. It's in our directory on our desktop Cordis projects. We only added one file, our blank schematic design. Here's our Cyclone 2 processor that I'm using. And everything looks good to go, so let's click Finish. So now what we'd like to do is go to our project files by clicking Files inside of the Project Navigator and find our schematic, our .bdf file, and right click and say set as top level entity basically saying this is my most advanced chip please make this the entry point to this hardware and you'll notice now in our hierarchy tab schematic one incomplete is our top level chip so let's double click that to open and here we are so now what we'd like to do is add our NAND chips to build this uh, OR AND and NOT gates up and to do that we can click on this little shortcut here that looks like an AND gate. And in our libraries, we can expand this. Uh, NAND is a primitive. We can expand our primitives. And we can expand the logic. And this has many, many primitive logic gates. And we can scroll on down here to NAND, specifically NAND2. And that's what you'll, you'll see. So let's click OK. And we are in repeat insert mode. So we can just continue to click and add new NAND gates as we see fit. So an OR is going to be a NAND gate for each dip switch. 
and then we will also NAND their results together. So we'll wire that up in just a moment. An AND gate is going to NAND together our two inputs and then NAND the output of our original NAND gate, basically nodding this value, which would NANDing a NAND is just an AND, an AND gate. And then down at the bottom for our NOT gate, well, all we have to do is take our single input and run it through a NAND, and that is the equivalent of a NOT. So now that we have our gates added, we can start wiring them up. And to do that, you just want to click on this icon here, which I believe this stands for the Orthogonal Node Tool. So just to get a better view of what we're connecting, let's zoom in to our schematic. And uh, for a keyboard shortcut, if you're interested, you just hold down Control, and if you have a scroller on your mouse, just scroll up, and you should be able to zoom right in. So now we can grab our incoming wire with the orthogonal tool, and just drag it over to our top and bottom <coughs> inputs for our NAND. And we can do the same thing for our, our bottom incoming wire, which should be dip switch number two. And you might notice that this orthogonal tool is a little unwieldy. So one thing you can do is go to a certain degree, let go, and the wire will stop there, and then you can pick it back up again by clicking again on it and dragging over to your destination. Okay, so what we can see here is that we've taken dip switch 1 and piped it into the first NAND gate, and taken dip switch 2 and put it into the second NAND gate. Now all we need to do is NAND their outputs, so we'll pick up the output of the first NAND and put it into the top input pin of our, our third NAND gate in the chip, and grab our second NAND gate and put it in the bottom input of our third NAND gate in the chip. And lastly, we'll grab the output and put it to the output of our chip. So that's wiring our OR gate together from NANDs. So let's come down to our AND gate, and as we mentioned, we'd like to take dip switch 3 and 4 and send them to inputs 1 and 2 of our first NAND gate. So once again, you can just take your orthogonal tool, click the wire, and extend it. We'll click and extend, and there we go. Now let's take our NAND gate and send it over to our second NAND gate. And finally, send the output of the second NAND gate to the output of the chip. And lastly, our NOT gate is to take our single input and send it to both input pins of the NAND gate, and then forward our NAND gate on along out to the output pin. And there we go. So what we've done here is taken two dip switches, piped them into two separate NAND gates, NANDed their outputs, and sent that out to LED1, which is the equivalent of ORing the values of these two dip switches together. Secondly, we've taken dip switch 3 and 4, ANDed them together, and NANDed the output of the original NAND. I'm sorry, we NANDed them together first, lots of NANDs, into another NAND, and then sent it to LED2. And overall, this will AND together, dip switch 3 and 4. And then finally, we've taken the output of our OR gate, sent it down here to our third schematic template, and NODded its output. So LED3 should be the NOT of the OR of dip switch 1 and 2. So lastly what we'd like to do is take this and first run an analysis on it to make sure that everything is kosher. So to do that there's this button up here next to our clock and our play button called Start Analysis and Synthesis. So let's click that. It's going to ask if we'd like to save our changes and we can say yes. Okay, and it looks like our analysis and synthesis was successful.
So I can click all right, so that lets us know that all our wiring is working good. And now we can go about setting up the actual pins on the board that we'd like to use for these LED inputs, or LED outputs and dip switch inputs. So to do that, now that we've run analysis, we can go to assignments and pin planner. And you'll notice, possibly because of seeing this for the first time ever, that pin planner is contextually aware of our four dip switches and our three LEDs from our schematic. And all we have to do is say the location on our Cyclo 2 processor of where they're physically going to be. So if you end up following the hardware tutorial later on, then these belong in pin 112. Oh, that didn't save. Let's try that again. Pin 112. There it is. Pin 113. Pin 114 and pin 115. Our three LEDs are going to live at pin 118, pin 119, and pin 120. And there we go. So what we've done now is taken our purely software inputs and outputs, and through Cordis, have been able to assign the physical pins on the actual hardware. So now that we've completed that, we can close our pin planner, close our compilation report, and run a full compilation on this schematic. So that's this play button next to the analysis and synthesis button. So we'll click that. And as you can see here, we have some percentages going, so it's uh, running a program called Fitter, which is finding the best path and best pins on our hardware for what we'd like to do and it's doing a full compilation of our design. All right, and our full compilation was successful, so let's click OK. So now the last thing we'd like to do is push this program to our physical hardware. Um, this is already under the assumption that you've gone through the tutorial and assembled your hardware, wired all your dip switches and LEDs together. And <clears throat> so if possible, please go ahead and grab that hardware and plug it in now. I can literally wait an infinite amount of time while you pause the video and go get everything put together. So go ahead and do that, and once that's finished, you should be able to plug it in your, your USB blaster. And to verify that your system is seeing the board, you can go to your command processor and type in JTAG config. And here it is, our USB blaster is connected to an EP2C5, which is what we'd expect. So now we can click on this icon here, which is Programmer. Here it's detected our board. And actually, let's back up one. Very important thing to do here. Right click on your processor in your project navigator and click on Device. Under Device and Pin Options, under Unused Pins, there's a drop-down menu for reserve all unused pins. And you want to change that to as try stated with weak pull-up. And this is going to prevent your board from basically just getting very hot. We'll click OK. And OK. And now, let's go ahead and click our programmer. Here's our breadboard with our compiled program ready to go, and all we have to do is click start. And there we go. That should send it over to your physical board. So hopefully you see something very much like what you may see in the following video. Okay, and it looks like our analysis and synthesis was successful. So we can click all right. So that lets us know that all our wiring is working good. And now we can go about setting up the actual pins on the board that we'd like to use for these LED inputs, or LED outputs and dip switch inputs. So to do that, now that we've run analysis, we can go to assignments and pin planner. And you'll notice, possibly because of seeing this for the first time ever, that pin planner is contextually aware of our four dip switches and our three LEDs from our schematic. And all we have to do say the location on our Cyclo 2 processor of where they're physically going to be. 
So if you end up following the hardware tutorial later on, then these belong in pin 112. Oh, that didn't save. Let's try that again. Pin 112, there it is. Pin 113, pin 114, and pin 115. Our three LEDs are going to live at pin 118, pin 119, and pin 120. And there we go. So what we've done now is taken our purely software inputs and outputs, and uh, through this software here, through Cyclone, <sighs> man, I just can't talk today, dude. This is just hilarious. I'll cut this out. That'd be good. Cordis. It's Cordis. Through Cordis. <laughs> Alright, here we go. <laughs> and through Cordis, I've been able to assign the physical pins on the actual hardware. So now that we've completed that, we can close our pin planner, close our compilation report, and run a full compilation on this schematic. So that's this play button next to the analysis and synthesis button. Just click that. And as you can see here, we have some percentages going. So it's uh, running a program called Fitter, which is finding the best path and best pins on our hardware for what we'd like to do, and it's doing a full compilation of our design. All right, and our full compilation was successful, so let's click OK. So now the last thing we'd like to do is push this program to our physical hardware. Um, this is already under the assumption that you've gone through the tutorial and assembled your hardware, wired all your dip switches and LEDs together. And <clears throat> so if possible, please go ahead and grab that hardware and plug it in now. I can literally wait an infinite amount of time while you pause the video and go get everything put together. So go ahead and do that. And once that's finished, you should be able to plug it in your, your USB blaster. And to verify that your system is seeing the board, you can go to your command processor and type in jtag config. And here it is, our USB blaster is connected to an EP2C5, which is what we'd expect. So now we can click on this icon here, which is programmer. Here it's detected our board. And actually, let's back up one. Very important thing to do here right click on your processor in your project navigator and click on device under device and pin options under unused pins there's a drop down menu for reserve all unused pins and you want to change that to as try stated with weak plug and this is going to prevent your board from basically just getting very hot Click OK. And OK. And now, let's go ahead and click our programmer. Here's our breadboard with our compiled program ready to go, and all we have to do is click Start. And there we go. That should send it over to your physical board. So hopefully you see something very much like what you may see in the following video.